Welcome to the Linden Hills History Study Group's virtual program. Tonight, Susan Hunter Weir will share stories and images from Wonderland Park, the 1905 popular Minneapolis amusement park. Susan Hunter Weir is retired from the University of Minnesota, where she worked as coordinator of academic advising for students in the visual and performing arts. She was the mayor's appointee to the Preservation Heritage Preservation Commission for nine years. She has served on several boards, including in the Heart of the Beast, the English Learning Center, and the Healy Project. I consider Susan the most knowledgeable person about the Pioneers and Soldiers Cemetery, located at the intersection of Cedar Avenue and Lake Street. And she knows the people buried there. The first person buried there died in 1853, which means she knows a lot of Minneapolis history and the people. Do check out their great website. Susan has been researching and fundraising for the for restoring Pioneers and Soldiers Cemetery for more than 20 years. Through her research, she learned about the Wonderland babies, 11 of them buried at the cemetery. From there, she delved into the history of Wonderland. I'm delighted to introduce Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Joellen, and thank you for everybody who's watching tonight. Um, as Joellen said, my name is Sue Hunter Weir, and I am interested in local history, particularly South Minneapolis, but pretty much anywhere. And I've been doing research for about 20 years. And in the course of doing research about the cemetery that I love, Pioneers and Soldiers on Cedar Avenue and Lake Street, I found um, the Wonderland Babies. This was some time ago. I think they're more commonly known now, but the park itself is fascinating. Um, and here we go. Wonderland Park was on Lake Street and 31st Avenue South. And to give you some sense of where that is, um, it was where there was a Walgreens store, which um, is being rebuilt after the protests and directly across the street from a McDonald's. So our landmarks. It was open from mid-May until mid-September during the years 1905 to 1911. And this is an artist's rendering of what the park looked like. It was a postcard for advertising. Um, it's a little bit deceptive. I like to think of it, this is how a kid would think about Wonderland because there are certain elements of the real Wonderland that are missing for artistic license. But the little diagonal road in front of the park that's um, down in the lower left-hand corner is Lake Street. And the road running it up from the bottom towards the right is 31st Avenue South. And you'll notice that there are some features in there. We call them rides. Back in the day, they called them devices. They did not yet have a phrase for it. But it ran from 31st Avenue to roughly the alley between not what is now 32nd and 33rd Avenue South. So there was a 500-foot frontage along Lake Street. It was 10 acres, uh, which is not a very big space to have 15 to 20 to sometimes 30,000 people milling about. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting um, phenomenon. The park was actually credited to uh, some very famous Minneapolis architects, Long and Long, who were also... Uh, Long was, had various partnerships, but they designed such things as Minneapolis City Hall, the Lumber Exchange, the Flower Exchange, and so forth. But this is not really one of the high points of their career um, because these parks were fairly standard. There were 400 of them around the country, and they pretty much all had the same look. You could walk into any one of them, and they would look like Minneapolis Wonderland. If you look in the distance past the roller coaster at the top, you'll notice that it's all green, that there's nothing there. Now, this is what we would think of as the area between 33rd or so Avenue and the river. And that's because it truly was pretty much undeveloped at that point. There are stories about little boys chasing hot air balloons that had crash landed in potato patches a few blocks from the park. And then you can kind of see some buildings across the river. Notice that it's Minneapolis on one side, St. Paul. This was considered Twin Cities Wonderland, even though it was in Minneapolis. And there is something that's conspicuously absent, 
that I will try to remember. One of the things that's kind of fun that I don't fully understand, you see down front there's um, a small arch. That's where they sold tickets. Cost 10 cents for adults, 5 cents for kids, but a lot of times they let them in for free because once you're inside, of course, then your kids are going to want cotton candy, hot dogs, all that good stuff. So nothing is free, really. Um, and they would have coupons to sort of promote the park. And I always start by asking people two questions. Who is the first person in your family to fly in an airplane? And how many crayons were in your box when you started school? We'll come back to those. Wonderland was established in 1905, or it opened in 1905, but they actually started erecting it in, the, in October of 1904. And this is hot on the hill, heels of the Lewis and Clark Exposition, otherwise known as the St. Louis World's Fair. And if you're a movie buff, you will remember Judy Garland singing Take Me to St. Louis Louis. That's what this was about. And some of the things that were popularized, so not necessarily invented for the first time at that fair, were hamburgers, hot dogs, ice cream cones, cotton candy, although they called it fairy floss back then, Dr. Pepper, and for those who didn't have a sweet tooth, puffed wheat. Now, why you would want to buy puffed wheats kind of beyond me, but they did. And one of the things I encourage you to do, something that's kind of fun to take a look at, is today, when you're looking at condiments, pick up a jar of French's mustard and look at the year that it was established. The company was started in 1904. In 5 Chutan, it had something to do with the World's Fair. And there's a difference now, too, to think about between a World's Fair, a State Fair, and Wonderland Park. World's Fairs were huge. The Lewis and Clark expedition was over 1,500 acres. It cost a lot more money to get in, 50 cents, which in those days was not an inconsiderable sum. But these were kind of international spectacles, and by and large, they were the whole idea was to say, we're the best in the world. Whatever you've got, our technology is better. Anything you can do, we could do better. And they would bring in some very, very bizarre acts um, from around the world just to sort of demonstrate American superiority. State fairs were much different. They, too, were kind of focusing on how great we are, but they tended to take the track of the world's biggest or the state's biggest pumpkin, right? I mean, there was this kind of agricultural thing that went with it. There was an educational piece. There was also um, a marketing piece. I think they've done away with it now, but there used to be Machinery Hill, and that's where you went to see what the latest tractors looked like. And a lot of sales happened for that. And what you have with a park like Wonderland is simply a midway. There's nothing edu nothing educational about it whatsoever. Um, it was pure fun. And that was the whole idea. That's why they could accommodate it in such a very small space. The one thing, too, that we did not have at Wonderland were freak shows, um, which is kind of a feature of a lot of these other parks. This was not, there were no freak shows at all. So we try and travel back to what life was like in 1905, and there were 8,000 cars, and that's in the entire country. That's not Minneapolis, which is fine because there were only 144 miles of paved roads. 8% of households had telephones. 14% had bathtubs, which always kind of makes me pause a little bit. The average wage was 22 cents an hour. Uh, which meant that a salary was $200 to $400 a year, which means that $0.10 cents for an adult and, you know, an outing to Wonderland could cost uh, not a great deal of money, but enough to be noticeable. 95% of births took place at home, and that becomes important in the history of Wonderland. The population of Las Vegas was 30, 30 people. Only 6% of Americans had graduated from high school, and two out of 10 could not read or write. There were 230 murders in the entire country, and only eight color crayons to a box. So this is a little bit like guessing your weight at the state fair. If you know how to tell me how many crayons you had, I could pretty much guess your age, because in 1903, they invented dustless chalk, 1905, eight colors, 
1948, we get up to 48 colors in a stadium seating box, which some of you will recognize from having gone to school. And then from 1958 to 64, or 1958, there were 64 colors, but they had a sharpener. Uh, in 1972, 72, 1990, 90 crayons. And starting in 2013, 120 crayons to a box. I have a box of those. I love them. And for those of you who like to have silly bets, crayons is the 19th most easily recognizable smell in the world. Coffee is number one. So continuing on with the idea of time traveling, if you look at how people were dressed, and keep in mind there was no air conditioning, going to Wonderland could be a nice way to cool off. This group picture happens to be people who worked for um, the Donaldson's department store. It was not uncommon for businesses, for organizations to take an annual outing to Wonderland. Mind you, they had to get all these people into Wonderland on streetcars, and I'm not quite sure how they managed to do that. But notice that the men are all wearing suits. Most of them, or many of them, are wearing hats. Um, not all of the women have hats, but it was very, very common. Children, Little boys wore caps, little girls wore straw hats. So these were big features of what it was like. And imagine yourself dressed like that in 90 degree heat hanging out on Lake Street, which looks somewhat like this. This is a picture from the American Swedish Institute of what it looked like on 20th Avenue and Lake Street, which is across the street from Pioneers and Soldiers Cemetery and is roughly where a new education building just went up within the last two years. Um, so this is pretty much what Lake Street looked like at the time. So the question is, why was Wonderland on Lake Street? For a couple of reasons. Public transportation, the streetcar. Residential and commercial development, the city was moving farther south. And there was a significant working class, middle class. These are union folks. These are the folks who worked for what became Minneapolis Moline. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood in South Minneapolis. And all of our dads were union electricians, plumbers, printers, and so forth. That was the nature of the neighborhood. No alcohol. They could not sell liquor south of Lake Street. We had what were called liquor patrol limits. And even as recently, certainly in my childhood, you could not sell any buy anything stronger than 3-2 beer anywhere south of Lake Street. There were blue laws. And it was also midway between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, I want to go back to the public transportation because something that's kind of fun about that is that on six, at 6.12 6 a.m. on May 27th, 1905, they hooked up the streetcar that ran down Lake Street. Prior to that day, if you were on Hennepin and Lake and you wanted to get to 27th and Lake, you had to go downtown and transfer back onto the Minnehaha line. So this was a very big deal because you could get on at Hennepin and Lake and go down to 27th Avenue. It stopped a little short um, of Wonderland for the first couple weeks because of <laughs> torrential rain. They couldn't get all the track laid. But there was a description in the paper that said at 6.12 a.m., imagine this, in the morning of May 27th, people lined the streets. Men were throwing their hats and canes in the air. Women were twirling dish towels. And strangely enough, little boys were pegging rocks at the power poles. But this was huge. And one of the things I noticed, if you, I'm kind of a fan of Lake Street and the changing commercial aspect of it. And I was doing some research. I was looking at the old Burma Shade building. And there are parts of that time where pretty much every other storefront was a shoe store. And at the time, my mom was still alive. And I said, what was that about? And she said, we had to walk everywhere, right? People went through a lot of shoes today. They'd all be Starbucks. Back then, they were shoe stores. The electricity, what happened there is that the streetcars generated electricity, which had very little, there was very little demand for that on weekends and evenings. And so all around the country, there were what they called trolley car parks, where they were saving this energy, storing it, and then using it on the evenings and weekends to run these parks. 
Now, Minneapolis wasn't strictly a trolley car park. It was privately owned by a Canadian company called Park Construction. But clearly, they had an arrangement with the streetcar company to hook up between the Lake Street line. This became a very important part of it. So Lowry and company did not own the Lake Street line, but they were very active in making sure that this whole thing worked. In the following year, 1906, they actually um, built up the bridge between Minneapolis and St. Paul so that it could handle these heavier streetcars than had been before, which made access to Wonderland all the much better. So... And I mentioned that no alcohol. This was a family resort, and they made that clear over and over and over again. Part of their advertising was that there was no vaudeville, which basically I think we can interpret means everybody kept most of their clothes on. There was no alcohol. Um, they advertised it as a family place where you could bring your children and that girls and women could go unaccompanied by men. That's how safe it was. So that's why it became very important. Um, here's a picture of Wonderland Park at night. Now, these postcards are actually pretty widely available on places like eBay. Um, they're a standard. They're fudged a little bit. Those rays are probably not authentic, um, that those were kind of added in. But this is the night scene. Now, you have to keep in mind that there weren't a lot of street lights or there were some gas lights, but not a lot. So the ambient sky, you know, there was no ambient light. The sky would have been very, very dark. And when they turned on all these lights at night, you could see these for miles. This is, and there's the electric tower, which mysteriously, it was white light bulbs, but at the top there are anchors for some reason. They kind of went with a nautical theme. Um, and those were red. It was 120 feet tall. There were 7,500 light bulbs on that thing. It was not meant for climbing. People did not climb it, although as kind of a public relations gesture, somebody got married at the top of the electric tower. Um, whenever things started to flag a little bit, you know, they would come up with some kind of a gimmick to make people pay attention. And there were a number of acts where people would dive off the tower. All in all, the park had 25,000 incandescent lights that were set. This says six inches. Should That's probably right. Um, I was going to say six feet, but no, but six inches. That's correct. This is a, I'm not sure how, exactly how they got the perspective on this because it's not accurate. But this, again, was one of the postcards. So before there was air conditioning, there was always a breeze at Wonderland, right? And this is part of the advertising that they had in the paper, Twin Cities Amusement Park, and the things they had, the scenic railway is what we would call a roller coaster. The old mill, these things are still around at the state fair. It's where you get a creaky old wooden rowboat and you go through some kind of a tunnel. Then um, shoot the shoots would be a ramp that you start at the top and go down to the water. We have slides of these. The airship swing, miniature train, carousel, infant incubators, which are one of the most interesting aspects of it. The fairy theater was basically a fence with knot holes in it and reversed lenses so that they had real people, life-size, dancing behind these boards. But when you looked at them through the fence, they looked like they were miniature, like they were fairies. Uh, the House of Nonsense, we've seen these kinds of things. These are the boards. So you step on a board and it kind of rattles you. Um, it's moving around. Myth City was a number of very strange kind of Greek um, mytho mythology, these illusions that they did that I'm not sure that people really understood the stories behind them, but these people would kind of appear and disappear. The Crystal Maze are the mirrors, you know, the... Uh, where you're tall and skinny or you're short and fat because the mirrors are distorting your size. And bump the bumps are the old hardwood slides that you went down on a uh, burlap sack. Um, I always think that is a lawyer's delight. That one must have been crazy. And fireworks. They had fireworks every Tuesday and Friday night. <laughs> 
As I mentioned, we called them amusement devices and diversions. A couple of things that are interesting. If you look in the upper right hand corner, that is the roller coaster, and it says goes 45 miles an hour. But look at the chairs, those are like kitchen chairs with probably a seat belt on them, but safety features not as we would know them today for sure. And then the thing down at the bottom that looks kind of like an umbrella. Uh, that's the airship swing. And this was the big deal. This is why I asked you who was the first person in your family to fly. It was futuristic. It was a, they describe it as a giant illuminated umbrella twirling around and round. And ask yourself how many people, that is adults, would have ridden in airplanes in 1905? And the answer is pretty much nobody. Orville and Wilbur had just gone up two years before and safety was assured. And the reason this, I could not understand this at first, I kept, they kept talking about these huge lines, all adults wanting to ride in these airships. And I thought it was the strangest thing because we think of it as a kiddie ride. It's something that little kids would go on, but nope, it was the adults. And it was just this novelty. Um, and there was a big buildup because it didn't arrive on time. It was supposed to be here for Decoration Day, Memorial Day, and didn't arrive till the 4th of July. And they were giving like at least three or four time weekly updates about where this thing was and when it was going to arrive. Here's the shooting the shoots. And okay, here's what was missing from the artist rendering. If you look off to the right, you see a bunch of power poles. You couldn't have that park. There were power poles everywhere. That was a very necessary piece to make this park function. And what this thing did, they would pull you up to the top with pulleys, and then you'd get in the rowboat, and then you would come sliding down. And the thing at the end of it, the ramp, had a slight upturn to it so that you would bounce across the water the way you, it looks like when you skip stones. So that was part of the fun, is getting yourself all wet. And the chute, I love the idea that you built an artificial lake in the land of 10,000 lakes, right? It was called, right, the longest in America. It was 220 feet long by 140 feet wide. It cost $16,000. In today, that's almost half a million bucks. It was a big deal. And this is how you arrived. The two boats were named the Minneapolis and the St. Paul. They missed nothing in terms of marketing. They knew what they were about. And here's one of the most interesting things. Um, there is not, I've never found a good picture of the carousel. And that's strange because it was built by the premier carousel builders in the world, the Denzel family. I, oh, I don't know, it's probably been five years, but I looked at uh, eBay and we could buy this giraffe, but it would cost, a, this one giraffe would cost us well over $100,000. They were the premier wood carvers and decorators of circus animals in the world. And one of the things that they did is they popularized things other than plain old horses. You had giraffes and bears and eagles and carriages. Um, and of course, they had music that what they called uh, get along music uh, with the organ that would happen. So, of course, ultimately the park disappeared, and I wondered what happened to the carousel. And I have not been able to find it yet, although I have a few clues to it. I tracked down the Denzel family, and they are still in business. They are out in Oregon, and they still do carousels, although they are not known for their carving. That skill was basically um, because they hired very a, a lot of Italian wood carvers who had this amazing skill. But the Denzels now, their carousels, their claim to fame is that they're solar-powered. And... They really know very little. I was surprised they didn't know much about the history of their family. But I can tell you the Minneapolis Public Library has a lovely book called The Art of the Carousel. And um, I would suggest you check it out sometime because they're stunning, absolutely stunning. And for those of us who remember Casey Jones, happy, happy birthday, right? We have a thing, a love affair with little trains. Um, and although I have to say, I can't think of a much more boring job than riding around in a circle all day on this little train, but he did. Scenic roller coaster. 
kind of a rickety structure. Um, and this thing went on and on. I want to back up a little bit and say, talk about the opening. Now, what happened is, in order to advertise this, the papers made no pretense whatsoever um, of being critical. This was going to be the greatest thing that ever happened in the Northwest. Minneapolis was still considered the Northwest. And the whole idea of this was kind of a boosterism, right? And it was to prove that we were not a bunch of hicks, that we were as good as Chicago, which in turn was as good as New York, which was in turn as good as London or Paris. And so this is a very important part of the city's identity. And it was, it was just shameless how they promoted this. Um, so on May 15th of 1905, they had a kind of a sneak preview where 15,000 people got in for free. The park was not finished. It wasn't completely landscaped. None of the rides were operative. But again, it was just sort of this buildup. And then the following day, May 16th, the papers started a countdown, a 10-day countdown, 10 every day in the paper, 10 days, 9 days, 8 days, going on and on and on. And on opening day, they had 15,000 people which was Decoration Day. It was a holiday. And the rivals were Minnehaha Falls, which was a big tourist attraction. They did not yet have um, the animal, the zoo out there. And the other attraction was the Nicollet Park ball field. So those were the three big things, all of which were accessible by streetcar. So they were very important. On May 30th was the day that it opened. And again, 15,000 people I read an, an article, and I'm a little skeptical about this, that said the streetcars were running every two and a half minutes. I'm not sure how that's possible, so you'd need a streetcar expert to explain that one to me. But um, there is no doubt that they were very busy, and very few people had cars, so that's how everybody was getting there. You either walked or you took a streetcar. Yeah, I want to look. One of the opening acts, and this becomes interesting because it's a bookend, but one of the opening acts on the first day was a high diver, a guy, man named Charles Strahl, and there are actually ladders named after him, which is kind of interesting. But his act was to jump from the top of the electric tower into a net. Um, and that's kind of what he did. Um, so in addition to the rides, what they did was they had open air acts, things that you, there was no big top, there was no tent. So there were all kinds of free things that people could see, usually aerial acts. But going back to the scenic railway, this is the longest of its kind in the country. Two round trips, three quarters of a mile, it costs $35,000, which in today's dollars is over a million. And here's the burlap slide, burlap slide. you can see the cartoon, people going down and I remember doing this out at Excelsior Amusement Park and cracking my head a couple of times on the hardwood. And here is the old mill, complete with, I love the sort of sense of humor, geography of this. There were witches' caves and igloos and deserts. And, oh, they had the Everglades so they could get some crocodiles in there. And this whole thing was an illusion done with lights and glitter. It costs, again, $16,000, about half a million. And here's the fun part. The performers, they were all amazing, great, sensational, fearless, or death-defying, right? Everybody had an act. Take your name, add an I or an O to the end of your name, first or last, doesn't matter, and you become exotic, you become Italian. So you take four men named Alvin, add an O, and all of a sudden you have the four Alvinos, right? This is a big thing. Being Italian, and <laughs> I don't quite get it, but they did it. And one of our most famous people, Eric Weiss, a Wisconsin native, took the name of his favorite French magician, added an I, and he turned himself into the great Houdini. There you go, right? But there's some other great names. Duval, the human rocket who did the slide for life, which meant he went down, he slid down a metal, uh, kind of a rope. Love this. Daredevil Dash, who did the dip of death. You can see there's a certain alliteration that goes on here. The letters D and F tend to lend themselves, apparently, uh, to good 
Fair names, Diavolo, who looped the loop. The fearless Freds, who looped the loop in the little cars, and the flying Baldwins. Frederick the Great, a wire walker and juggler. And my favorite, Howard the Impaler, a knife thrower. Now, that's a terrible name. You do that once and Howard's out of business, so I don't know how they came up with that for him, but it's a strange one. So the, these acts were high divers, trapeze artists, and human rockets. Rockets were really kind of an amazing thing, and you can sort of see they would set up trapezes, um, jumping into some of the people. They would string like a, a bicycle ramp, and they would go down the tower and splash into the lagoon. Just all these kind of crazy acts. Here's a high diver. He's another one who's jumping into the water from, from high up. And here I think is another example of kind of the exotic names, Alma Fedora and her husband, Herr Granada, um, who probably were named something like Mr. and Mrs. Jones, but that doesn't sell tickets. And here's, an, again, an artist rendering Diablo. One of the most interesting acts and one of the most dangerous acts was looping the loop on a bicycle. And this really, really nice cartoon shows this kind of death-defying act of this guy riding down a ramp, going up over the top on his bike and coming down. Now, back in the day, these bicycles were not like modern bikes. They were not lightweight. These were made out of heavy pipes. Um, and a lot of people got very seriously injured doing this. Some actually got killed doing it. Um, in 1902, the Elks had a meeting in Minneapolis, and one of the people was severely injured who was supposed to do it. And so they were running ads to anybody who would be willing to take it on, paying like 50 bucks. And people were doing it and breaking arms and having all these. Nobody could do it. They couldn't loop the loop. But comes 1905, 1906, and pretty much lots of people can do it. Um, I have a nephew who is a physicist, so I asked him, I said, so Gavin, what changed? And he said, they learned a little something about momentum. The ramp wasn't long enough, it wasn't steep enough, and once they figured that out, it wasn't that big a deal. Still impressive looking. But look at the artist's rendering on this. I think this is hilarious because that looks pretty fancy, pretty sophisticated. That's what it looked like. And look at the guy up in the right-hand corner with those gorgeous ears. That is Diavolo. That's the devil. Very famous. His name is Matheson. And of course, the minute he started doing it, there were all kinds of pretenders. Um, there were Diavolos all over the country, but this is what happened. But look at what these ramps actually look like as opposed to the way the artist had done them. So I always think of it, there's the little kid's imagination of what was happening versus the hard reality of, of these constructions. And the aerialist, Madame Zamora, right? Same thing. And they describe her as very petite, but I love this because look at her muscles. I mean, she's amazing. Um, and you would have to be that strong to be an aerial performer. And then they had these nonsense acts. I mean, <laughs> I, I have no idea, but Mae Gordon's original insane moving pedestal is what they call this one. And there was music. Um, big bands would come to town and they would play at Wonderland. But there was also the Minneapolis Journal had a cadet band that was made up of local kids um, many of them orphans or fatherless who would be given musical instruments, and they turned out to be excellent musicians and wound up touring around the country, and they were a big feature at Wonderland. And I want to say before we talk to the not everybody who loved Wonderland, one of the things that I find amazing is there were not really much in the way of animal acts. There were a few bicycles on bears and a couple of monkeys, but not big cats, right? And the one that I love, that I read a description up, I didn't read a description, I saw that it was an act. It was called uh, a trained anteater. So if any of you know what you can train an anteater to do, I'd love to hear about it because I cannot imagine what you can train other than eat ants and maybe play with a ball. I don't know. It's pretty interesting. But not everybody loved Wonderland. 
uh, across the street, and I haven't been able to pin the exact location, but I'm guessing it's right by um, McDonald's, there was this very small Presbyterian church, Elam, and they took Wonderland's owners to court to prevent the park from being open on Sunday. They said it was a violation of the fourth commandment to honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And as a matter of fact, they were right. It was against state law and had been since the territorial days. So the problem was, of course, that people were going to the ballpark every Sunday afternoon. There were all kinds of things that were open. Stores couldn't be, except for essentially drugstores, stores that sold necessities, but you couldn't go shopping on Sundays. And that lasted well into like the 1960s and 70s that a lot of stores were not open on Sunday. So the folks at Elam took the owner, I mean, it's this tiny little church, and they took the owners of Wonderland to court to try to get them to shut down. And what I found was at the... Minnesota Historical Society has the court case file, and in it there are about 70 depositions, which are absolutely fascinating because they are both sides. Although the ones that are in favor of Wonderland, it's boilerplate language. By and large, what happened, I'm sure, is that the owners of Wonderland sent a lawyer door-to-door asking people, do you agree with this, and getting them to sign off. And with The ones who loved it, they loved it because it brought street lights, it brought security, it brought gutters, curbs and sewers, paved streets, and it extended the streetcar line. It built platforms for disembarking, which I'll tell you in a second, and music, right? It was music. The platforms were very important. Um, One of the things that happened was the streetcar lines ran down the middle of the street, more or less, and people were getting off the streetcars in traffic, which included everything from bicycles, pedestrians, few cars, some horse carriages, um, and a staggering number of people were killed getting off streetcars. And so that became kind of an important piece of this. And remember, nobody had a a radio or a television. So on a hot summer night, you could open your windows if you lived around Wonderland, and you could listen to a band concert. You could have your own private concert. Those who hated it believed, in addition to violating uh, the Fourth Commandment, that the noise from the park interfered with their Sunday services. And one of the depositions that I found most interesting was from a woman whose name became familiar to me. And the thing that she objected to was there were, there was a man sitting up in at the top of the electric tower and it had a spotlight and they would shine it down onto the Lake street and kids who didn't have 10 cents to get into the park or a nickel would hang around in the street because they could hear the music. They could see the lights. They could see everything that was going on. And this mother strongly objected to this. And in a, she's connected to the cemetery in quite a peculiar way. But the fact of the matter is she was a widow. She was only in her 30s. She had five daughters, all teenagers, and she lived a block from the park. And five will get you 10 that on, her kids were sneaking off and standing in the street. So that was her thing, was the spotlight and getting the teenage girls in particular, the guy would shine it on them and the girls would giggle and run away and come back. And, and this was going on all night long. And here's the beauty of it. The Infantorium, this is what it became famous for. This is what it looked like at the time. It doesn't look like this much anymore. But the Infantorium was a baby hospital, a hospital de- uh, designed to take care of premature babies. And it was the brainchild, basically, of a man named Dr. Martin Cooney. Now, he was a German physician, and he did not invent the incubator, but he popularized it. Back in the 1890s, he had a very difficult time persuading the medical community to take him seriously, so he decided to take it to the people. And there was a lot of blowback about that. He became very unpopular with a lot of people in the medical community, Um, because they thought that this was, you know, showmanship, that it was really inappropriate. And at the time, a lot of people believed that interfering in life, beginning and endings, was a religious issue, that 
some babies were simply destined to die and going to heroic ends to try and save them was just morally wrong. But he didn't care. He was a true believer. And he said, if you feed them right, if you keep them warm, uh, then they will be okay. What he absolutely hated, however, was people billing, we have the tiniest baby in the world because those babies were not going to survive. They don't survive today. There's a one pound baby, very unlikely, unlikely that that child will survive. And if they do, they're going to have many physical issues, possibly for all their entire lives. And when I showed you the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, they had an infantorium that had 14 incubators. It was a commercial, not a medical enterprise. They didn't know what they were doing. And in a matter of months, they would go out and they would find babies in homes for uh, unwed moms, um, women who couldn't afford to take care of their babies. They were going around, finding all these babies, taking them to the fair. Half of them died from bacterial infections and so forth. Um, Martin Cooney was just beside himself. He was so angry. He was livid. But when a doctor finally stepped in uh, to St. Louis and turned things around fairly accurately. But what's interesting is to this day, Martin people still um, criticize Martin Cooney. I found an article on the internet written by a very reputable doctor in which he says, you know, Martin Cooney made a lot of money off this. Um, Martin Cooney said he invented the incubator and he didn't. And because I'm kind of a footnote snob, I sent an email to this guy and said, gee, I'm curious about the source of those statements. And he said, oh, I'm sure it's in the footnote somewhere. And I thought, no, it's not, because I'm one of those weirdos who reads footnotes. It's not there. So there's prejudice against him. And I think what he could be faulted for is his records have not been found. He claimed to have an 85% success rate. Did he? Don't know. Uh, what I do know is I did a little math. Um, I looked at death certificates and figured out, you know, the park is open 15 weeks a year. There were this many infant deaths at Wonderland during this time period. There were seven incubators and figure an average stay of such and such. I had this formula all worked out. And truth be told, I think he it looked very possible that he was right about that. The thing that we can't know is about the babies who survived because, of course, there's no record of them. All we know are the babies that were lost. And um, as Joellen said earlier, 11 of them are buried in the cemetery on Cedar Avenue and Lake Street. They are not the only babies, but they may well be the majority. And you can see in this picture, what's interesting about it is, of course, very obvious that the baby on the right is premature. What about the baby on the left? I mean, that's kind of a big bruiser there. And many years ago, in a different lifetime, I went to nursing school. And one of the things is that babies who are well past their due date are at high risk, too, of lung infections. They get wet lungs. And so that's probably what was going on with this baby. And of course, to ward off criticism, these tiny morsels of humanity, which we call babies, um, they continually promoted this. This was not amusement. This was science. This was science. And they had to be very specific about that, that this was not a freak show, that these were legitimate uh, means for saving babies. And what would happen is people would go in, they would pay their 10 cents, and a nurse would give them a lecture. You didn't get to see the babies without listening. Um, and it was probably a very good thing because people's understanding, everything she was telling them would have been a good way to take care of a full-term baby as well. So that was part of it. And people became quite attached to the babies that they considered their babies, and they would go back week after week to check on the progress that their babies were making. Ultimately, the babies were um, returned to the parents, um, and that was sort of the whole thing. The other thing is, this did not cost the parents anything. There was no charge for doing this. The entire costs were covered by these 10 cents tickets that people had. Um, 
and they did not discriminate based on race. There were um, at least there was at least uh, one African American baby because he won the beautiful baby contest in 1907 at Wonderland Park. So we know this. So it was really quite an interesting humanitarian effort. Again, twins and triplets were especially high risk, as again they are today. I mean, some things just simply don't change. I've looked at the 11 babies um, who are buried in the cemetery and their families, and they're pretty standard. The moms were 17 years old or 49 years old. They were all high-risk pregnancies in some fashion or another. And because I'm very sentimental, I always want to make sure I went and checked all the families to make sure that they had other kids that... This was not just a staggering loss for them and happy to report that they all were pretty good. One of the most interesting ones um, is the Severin family. I became quite fond of the parents, Axel and Matilda. She was 48 when they lost their baby. Um, They had lost one a couple years earlier. But what's interesting is they already had six children who were fine. So it's an interesting thing to think about how badly they wanted these babies to survive, that they would do something as odd as taking them to an amusement park. It's odd, you know, by any standard. But then when I was looking at it, I found out something very interesting. I started to wonder, how did people figure this out? How did they learn about this? Well, Axel Severin drove a streetcar. He was probably on the Lake Street line. This is the only part of Wonderland that still exists, the Infantorium. It's still there. It's on 31st Avenue and 31st Street. It's an apartment building. Um, This picture is actually a little nicer. I drive past it several times, a month anyway. And it does need some tuck pointing and some, uh, some care. But it's just a fascinating building. It's the only piece that survived. So Wonderland closed on September 17, 1911. Remember I told you Charles Strahl was a high diver, and that's how they opened it. They also closed the park with a high diver, but it was an unfortunate one. He was a man who jumped off the tower, and he was killed because that happened. You have to hold the net exactly right. If it's too tight, you know, somebody will bounce back up in the air and fall off the edge. Or if it's too loose, they will hit hit the deck. And that's what happened to him. And I think it sort of ended on this kind of unhappy note. The park was actually demolished in April of 1912. And there are num- an amazing amount of speculation as to why it was. Um, people say, well, you know, it was no longer profitable. And that's probably partially true. Poor weather, maybe. Um, but... That doesn't explain why pretty much all 400 of them around the country started closing about the same time. Increasing real estate values probably played a part, but I think the big one is the big ones are these two: that there was greater domestic demand for electricity. My house was built in 1911. My house was built with electricity. Houses built earlier had gas, so. I'm thinking that all of a sudden, if it wasn't profitable, it's because you could get rid of the electricity in other ways. And there was also competition from other amusements. If you look at Lake Street, actually, if you look anywhere in town, any space bigger than a phone booth that you could put two chairs in became a movie theater. There were probably a dozen of them on Lake Street alone, and this was kind of all the rage. Plus, you also had more people with cars right? People could get to other places. But it was kind of a wrenching event. Um, And somebody from the Minneapolis Journal wrote kind of an obituary for Wonderland Park, which he referred to as the old amusement park. Now remember, it was only there for seven years. The way he talked about it, you'd have thought it had been there since the American Revolution. And this is a very flowery thing. I'm not going to read it all because it it's long and actually it's so sentimental that it's kind of wow but he ends it by saying wonderland is gone gone 
Its acres will soon be reduced to the characteristic ugliness of vacant lots, which enterprising agents will assure homemakers are well worth all they ask for them. Sick transit Gloria Mundi, thus passes the glory of the world. Wonderland is gone. There you are. Then we'll take to any of you who have questions, we'll be happy to try and answer them for you. All right. We've got some chat questions about the airplane. Were you thinking that it was a military or commercial or private when the question about when was the first flight? I wasn't thinking anything, but I think the answer for most of us is going to be military. I think if you look back, oh. um, our grandparent, your father, or depending on your age, in my case, it was my father who was actually enlisted in the Royal Air Force. He was a Brit. But I think World War II, um, I don't know if you want to call it a gave an opportunity, um, but I think that's what it was. Commercial air flight would have been very expensive and pretty unusual. Um, so I think most, for most people, it's going to tie into some kind of military experience. Um, but it's fun to think about, right? I mean, I just could not get over how crazed people were to get on this goofy little ride and were willing to stand in line for hours uh, to go for maybe two minutes spinning around in the air. And the, that was the only thing I could think of. And it's really kind of a wonderful, sweet commentary, I think, um, about simpler times, not necessarily easier times always, but simpler times. Uh, a question came up, is there a connection between Big Island and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Wonderland? Yeah, the, that was the Big Island out in um, Excelsior, Minnetonka, was the, other, the opposite end of the uh, rail line, but it was a little bit different. They were more into band concerts. Because it was an island, I think they did more by way of picnics. Um, not so much this kind of carnival midway aspect, um, but I think that that was it. And there was also one out in White Bear Lake called Wildwood. And I'm not sure exactly what that connection was. I'm not as familiar with that. But yeah, I mean, people could go to both. Um, but South Minneapolis, of course, I'm very partial to South Minneapolis. I've lived here all my life. So um, I think that it was a very special place and probably had a different appeal uh, to families because of the rides and, and that kind of activity. So, yeah, but they are the one in, they certainly were connected by streetcars, yes. The reason I asked it is the, the years are exactly the same, 1905 to 1911, which mm -hmm. I thought maybe there's a company connection there somehow, uh, an amusement company connection. Yeah, I don't think that the people who built Wonderland, his name was, um, I'm going to lose it here. I want to say Dorsey. He did not own uh, Big Island. He definitely owned Wonderland. So I'm not sure I'd be willing to bet that ownership of Big Island may have been the trolleys, the Twin City Rapid Transit kind of connection. And clearly that was the connection. It was what do you do with all this electricity and give people sort of opportunities to um, have a good time, actually, pretty good time. I can't imagine that there was a kid in South Minneapolis short of those who had a very pronounced religious objection uh, who did not go to Wonderland at least once during the years that it was open. I'd be very surprised. I also forgot to mention the orphans. You know, they were big into orphans and <laughs> they would have outings, which is very cool. And what they would do is they'd sign up with the automobile clubs, which actually they had those big sort of open cars and they would go collect children from orphanages like St. Joseph's Home. And there was a Hebrew Children's Society um, and they would take them to Wonderland and they would have a day, a free day at the park, which I thought was kind of a cool thing for them to do because the kids would have been hearing about it probably. And yeah, yeah, not having a nickel, it would be kind of nice for somebody to treat them. So they did that. So the so the actual Wonderland company treated them. No, it was civic civic organizations. Um, you know, we don't see. Well, I don't travel in those circles, maybe. So maybe they're still out there. But kind of these 
civic engagement uh, business type people who are busy elks and oh I don't know rotary is probably as close as we might come on some of these things who are providing opportunities for kids who otherwise don't have them but it was a very big deal and it was it was kind of a kind thing to do yeah one of the things that I that I learned that I thought was absolutely fascinating was there used to be this myth that a child born in the seventh month of gestation was more robust and more likely to survive than a child who was born after eight months. And this was a very commonly held belief. You see it in the newspapers, you kind of see it everywhere. Well, now they have figured out what happened there. And they went back and looked at when the mothers of the seven month babies got married and it turned out that people were, the women were pregnant and they were telling a little white lie about when they got pregnant. So, but it said the whole medical community was buying into this seven month versus eight month baby, which you could fool some of the people all of the time, right? Yeah, I and I had two favorite, two favorite stories that I thought, one was characteristic of how Minnesotans tend to think of themselves, which is um, a promoter came from New York and he said he had a petrified whale, right? Um, and that they would set it up and people would pay, they would have some kind of a tent or a tarp and people could see it for 10 cents. Well, it turned out that it was not a petrified whale at all. It was um, made out of oil cloth and wood laugh, right? It was fake. And the manager of the park said, no. And he was, and the guy said, oh, they love this in New York. And the guy's like, no, this is not New York. We do not give away our dimes, you know, uh, <laughs> to be made fools of. And I thought that was really kind of a very Minnesota um, mindset. I got a kick <laughs> out of that. But one of the most fun things I have, I like to, I like to call and I don't know, probably torment people. But in 1906, there was a lot of rain, a lot of rain. And down around what is now 36th and Lake, people swore that there were lizards falling out of the trees, dropping out of the skies, actually. Like some kind of biblical plague. And I'm thinking, now I know nothing about reptiles, not a thing. But I did go on the DNR website and I tracked down the DNR reptile expert and I sent him a copy of this newspaper story and said, what were they seeing, you know? And it turned out, he sent me, what a sweet person. He sent me back the equivalent of like a two or three page letter on email and said, no, there aren't any lizards in Minneapolis. He took it me so seriously. And I was serious, but this was way more somber and kind of sober than I would normally have expected. And he said, what they were seeing would be salamanders. <laughs> said, and it's the mating season for salamanders and they weren't falling out of the sky they were coming up out of the ground so i thought if i ever get a book written this guy gets acknowledged he's he's in the acknowledgments for sure for just having answered that goofy question so that was fun <laughs> there's a question in the chat um what was the result of that lawsuit that the church um uh, brought yeah. against wonderland it was interesting. That whole thing was very interesting because I got the sense from reading the depositions, but also sort of looking at what happened to that church generally, that the minister might have been, as we would say, a little not right. Um, because he was adamant, because they, they had been offered that they will move uh, the church. They said, the Wonderland people said, you know, well, we'll physically move it. Back then they used moved houses and buildings around all the time. But they, he was like, no, that, that doesn't solve the problem. It's still a Sunday opening. We want you closed on Sunday. And then the court case got delayed. It was put off for six months. And then it just disappeared altogether. So I think there was some kind of settlement. Now, Elam was, um, I'm trying to think. Westminster is the mother church, and I've forgotten what we would call this little baby church, and it was very, very tiny. Um, so there may have been some lawyer action in there, and they wound up uh, disappearing. And the minister did not last long in Minneapolis. None of the members of his people, none of the people who gave depositions had been members of that church 
much longer than I, six months to a year. So it seemed like there was a very heavy turnover within the congregation that would be really interesting to learn more about. I've contacted Westminster and they know very, very little about this church, this kind of goofy little offspring church. Hmm. But yeah, you can imagine these people being very serious and church was an all day event. You know, you went in at 10, maybe went home for lunch, came back, went home for dinner, came back and they would go on until 10 o'clock at night. So Max, uh, Max looked up, Max Halpern looked up and he said that the, he says on the chat that uh, the church was at the Northwest corner of East Lake Street and 32nd Avenue South. Okay. But then he goes on, he also then looked up the building permits and he says that on the South, uh, there are building permits in the index that are on the South side of, of Lake. And then Bob Byers commented about the airplane ride at Excelsior that allows uh -huh. you to steer the airplane with a rigid sail on the yeah. front. And he wondered if the Wonderland Air uh, Ride had such a sail. They had a rudder. Yeah, there were rudders on. They were made out of canvas. They were described as looking like big canvas cigars. And they had a rudder, but the extent to which you actually had any control, I think that's one of those more pretending that you have control because, you know, it's the spinning that is going to determine the speed and direction. And if you think about rides generally, there's only so many things you can do. You can go around and around and around. You can go up and down. And pretty much every ride that you can think of is sort of based on that kind of movement. There is not, they can make them fancier with lights and they had one crazy thing that was, that <laughs> did not catch on. It was called the laundromat where you sat, you were enclosed and they had all kinds of foamy bubbly stuff around you. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. Really? So your whole thing is that you're in a washing machine? I gosh, what fun, you know? So it was really kind of neat. And the problem for Wonderland is balancing the new and the familiar, right? Because it was in the same location, every year you had to have something familiar because people would want to come back and see, you know, uh, the carousel or the babies. But at the same time, you had to have something new to attract them. And that I think is what they were always kind of looking for is how to find that perfect balance. I spent a lot of my childhood at Excelsior Amusement Park um, because church groups, everybody, end of junior high school, our picnic, our class picnic, they would haul us out there and the rides, the activities were very, very much the same as Wonderland. Um, not a lot of change there really, but the, they didn't get the carousel, unfortunately. Susan, uh, the uh, Excelsior Amusement Park airplane ride, I finally remember because it was a blast to push that <laughs> sail rudder so far so you could really get out there. Of course, you had two cables that kept you going in the, in the circle, but you could move that darn thing in and out. And that was the very fun part. <laughs> Imagine these folks. Had, had that a feeling of uh, flying their plane. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, isn't that, people always say, wouldn't you have liked to live back then? And clearly the answer is heck no, um, because, you know, things like medical advances, I mean, life is way more complicated now, but there, are, there have been quite a lot of improvements. Um, but what we kind of miss is that wow factor, you know, uh, that seeing those canvas airplanes, would be just like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never done anything like this before. And even something like um, a lot of times kids would only get ice cream on the 4th of July, right? I mean, it wasn't, you could go get haagen 24 hours a day over at Lund's. Um, so I think a little bit of that, wow, that sort of simpler life um, is something that you you feel kind of bad about that. I don't know that that exists for people the same way that it did. Um, hard to say. Of course, you know, they all have iPads and whatever. <laughs> and there's an upside to that too, you know, but yeah. Um, the Fun House was my favorite. At yeah, remember the, 
yeah, there were those boards and you would put they you would put one foot on one and one foot on the other and they would be, you know, kind of juggling you around and and uh, the thing, the big thing with with us for kids was, um, you know, of course, the roller coaster at Excelsior was amazing. And for the boys in particular was how many times could you go on it without losing your lunch? Um, <laughs> and frankly, somewhere along the way, I developed this extraordinary fear of heights. So I would no more go on a roller coaster anywhere um, now. And, you know, one thing that was missing from Wonderland, if you notice this, there was no Ferris wheel. All right. Now, there was a Ferris wheel at the Chicago World's Fair, um, and they had one at the Minnesota State Fair, but somebody actually got killed because they were wicker baskets for the seats that were just kind of bolted on, and one of the bolts broke and dumped a lady from the top, and she died. So, you know, the safety features that are sort of built into rides now simply did not exist back then. Um, people also probably weren't as aware of the risks as they are now. One of the guys um, who did a uh, dip of death routine, um, I was in contact with one of his relatives who, I found this thing that said he died. He was a young man, he was 28 years old and he was a steel worker um, from Ohio. Now they paid outrageous money for these acts. So a guy who, you know, might earn two hundred and fifty dollars a year, could earn fifty dollars a week doing these daredevil acts. And I saw that this guy died in Fall River, which is Lizzie Borden's hometown. Um, and I was even doing one of these. Oh, please don't have it be an accident related to his act, and that, but that's exactly what it was. The very rigid frame on his bicycle fell apart. He fell off and he died. And um, I tracked down his family, which you love ancestry, and um, corresponded with them a little bit about this man. He was just 28 years old, married, had a couple of kids, but did it for the money, basically. I had asked a question earlier in the chat. Um, I was looking at the advertisement for uh, Mr. Diavolo, uh -huh. and there is this yellow um, body of text at the bottom. And I was wondering if that was a liability disclaimer. I don't think so, but I'd be somewhat surprised. I think it was, first of all, people weren't as litigious as they are now. Um, you know, that these guys who did these acts and who got killed probably did not wind up suing everybody under the sun. Um, Somebody did sue though, now that I think about it. Uh, somebody got injured on a ride and I think sued for $15,000, but I haven't found whether he actually collected on that. Um, and if you've never run across, there's this one great character. He's, I think the, one of the greatest characters in Minneapolis. It was a goofy minister named uh, Reverend uh, G.L. Morrill. And it was Julian Lewis Morrill as the Morrill Hall at the university, but they called him GL for go lightly. <laughs> and this guy was an absolute maniac who came from a long line of very peculiar ministers. He had twin brothers who had a church in Chicago that was built in the shape of a ship. And they used to preach wearing sailor suits. Well, Reverend mm -hmm. Go Lightly was one of these people who would do things like go out to Nicollet park and he would stand on the mound before a baseball game and he would preach to everybody and he and during this lawsuit with wonderland he went to the park and um was giving reports back and i did a one of these kind of name searches on the newspaper hub there were ten thousand hits on his name <laughs> this man was the most astonishing astonishing self-promoter that i have ever heard and he actually, he wound up dying. He lived in Powderhorn Park, which I think is very cool. But he wound up dying in Los Angeles. But what he, in the 1920s, he actually did his own eulogy. He recorded his own eulogy and preached at his own funeral. This guy is terrific. So if somebody needs a book to write, got it? G.L. Morrill. Go for it. <laughs> Contact me. I, mean, mm -hmm. point, I won't have time to do it, but I think he's one of the most interesting people ever. He's just a character and a half. So, mm -hmm. 
and if any of you think of anything later, people are welcome, you know, to email me. Um, so my email is s hyphen, and the hyphen's important. Otherwise, we annoy this lady who worked in the med school. S hyphen hunt one, the digit, at umn.edu. So imagine this poor lady used to get all these emails about a cemetery. And she's going, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Who are you? Go away. So, yeah. Oh, dear. Susan, this was just great. What a fun topic and very entertaining and uh, so much information. Really appreciate it. Well, you know, if it wasn't for that stupid COVID, I would have given each of you a box of Cracker Jacks. That's what I do <laughs> when I do this, but I can't throw them through the screen at you. Um, but thank you all. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it.